the people that I know uh, hold Ricky in awe. And magicians, if not the magicians themselves, people I know who have spoken to other magicians. Granted, it's a certain degree of hearsay, but uh, Ricky's held in awe. And like I say, I keep going back to the word sophisticated with Ricky. You don't, you don't feel um, you know, like you're being amused. You feel like something larger is happening. You know, that there's something that goes back maybe 2,000 years, you know, when you're watching Ricky. You know, you could hear Glenn Gould play uh, Bach's two-part inventions, you know, which everybody starts out playing when they start playing the piano when they're six years old. Glenn Gould plays them, you say, oh my God, that's extraordinary. You know, you see, Cezanne does uh, Mont Sainte Victoire, right? And there's three little lines of pastel, pastel paint, and you say, my God, that's the most beautiful mountain I've ever seen. Or, or Michael Motion, the juggler, has one of his routines he does, he juggles one ball. And it's what Ricky does is just is so extraordinarily pure and honed and uh, and perfect. He's he's the man. He's it. There are, I, I came to discover, th really three Ricky J's. There's the, the public persona, then there is the private persona, and then there's the 
private persona, within the private persona. Why is he so secretive about his early life, his family, his father, his mother? Uh, what do you think three, actually what happened? I assume it was unhappy, and I don't know more than that. I mean, he told me um, a story uh, about his father. He said the only thing you, you know, he said my father brushed his uh, teeth with Ipana and put Brill Cream on his hair, and he kept the um, tube of hair oil in one place and the toothpaste tube in another place. And uh, when I was about nine years old, I switched the tubes around. And uh, the only thing you really need to know about my father is that after he had brushed his teeth with hair oil, he brushed his hair with toothpaste. Um, I don't know anything else about the man. And um, I can only assume that he didn't get it. But what shaped him far more than, uh, you know, an unhappy childhood is his relationship with his grandfather, which was a happy relationship, and specifically this hanging out with these magicians in New York. I mean, this was the place to be if you were going to become Ricky Jay. This was at a time when Ricky had already left home. I mean, he had become a vagabond uh, sort of at the age of 18, you know, was attending different schools, living upstate New York in the Midwest, and... Uh, never went home again. Now, what do you want me to do? Just match in a card for me. Ten of diamonds. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to try to do this. This is it's a strange, a strange concept, but uh, I think I ought to be able to do this. So, um, okay. Hmm. All right, I'm going to... Hmm. All right. Ten of diamonds. All right. This is a man, a somewhat imposing human being, uh, a little bit fearful to countenance, who has the most extraordinary grace, physical grace, with a pack of playing cards. And what he's, not just his skilled sleight of hand, which only magicians can understand, but just the way he holds a deck, removes a card from it, the way he shuffles a deck of cards, is a beautiful thing to watch. Lovely, lovely hands. But Ricky is also a great, great scholar of the, particularly the, the Western European tradition of all sorts of ragamuffins. Uh, magicians, con artists, uh, freaks, various kinds who, who do low-level entertainment for the masses. He is, is a, a, a deep historian in this area who knows it all and thinks carefully and wisely about it. So he brings together in his performances and in, in, in his love uh, both the incredible physical skill and grace and this intellectual awareness of the con man and, and, and the, the minor artists who entertain us. And they bring, he brings the two together in his presentations. Um, I'm actually looking at my own magazine. Is that allowed? This is uh, Jay's Journal of Anomalies. I, 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 have, to, I have to confess that, that I take um, some sort of cumulative pleasure at seeing each new issue join the racks of the ones which preceded it. it um, it's, it's literally a personal reflection of what, of what interests me. But what interests you is a sort of range of entertainment? Yeah, well, here, actually, um, on, this, on this playbill, we did this uh, before we even launched the magazine, and it calls it a quarterly periodical devoted to the investigation of conjurers, cheats, hustlers, hoaxers, pranksters, jokesters, imposters, pretenders, sideshow showmen, armless calligraphers, mechanical marvels, and popular entertainments. I mean, that, that's literally the scope of what interests me, literally. So I, I'm planning issues in the future, one on cheating at bowling, uh, which goes back to the 16th century. Um, the issues about Houdini imitators, Houdini, Houdini, Nizini, and Zucchini pretenders to the throne. It, it really runs the gamut. And again, like I said, it, it's just, it's, it's kind of lovely for me that, that there, there is no limitation to it. I mean, the limitation is this, that, that I have something interesting and hopefully original to say, and that I have really wonderful graphic material to go along with it. 
this particular issue is on Edward Bright. Uh, at his death in 1750, he weighed between 616 and 620 pounds. The thing that particularly intrigued me about him is the concept that he, when he was dead, there was a wager about how many people could fit in his waistcoat. And this is the, from the original engraving, which I have from 1751. Five grown men of the age of 21 were supposed to fit in his waistcoat. But in this case, you can see he wins the bet when seven men the age of 21 fit in the waistcoat without straining a stitch or popping a button. What about this book? <laughs> well, this is, um, this is actually the, the German translation of, uh, of Learned Pigs and Fireproof Women. Um, a book I wrote a number of years ago uh, about the oddest and most unusual entertainers, uh, um, and particular entertainers that really captured my passion in a wide variety of fields, you know. Um, learned pigs, poison resistors, mind readers, singing mice, uh, conjurers. Um, Matthew Buchinger, the little man of Nuremberg, was born in 1674. Uh, his arms were they, were, they were sort of like uh, thalidomide flippers. And yet, uh, even though he was 28 inches high as a full, as a full grown adult, he had a, a remarkable string of accomplishments. He played many musical instruments. He was a dancer. He danced the hornpipe, even though he had, which I guess we would call stumps rather than feet. He did trick skittle shots, trick bowling shots, did sleight of hand, which is what attracted me to him uh, initially. Uh, played cards and dice, uh, could uh, thread needles and so. And I, I think he's a great example of the indomitability of the, the human spirit, and just utterly uh, extraordinary. And I dare say he was one of the most famous people in the world in, in the era in which he lived. Oh, no. There are a limited number of fields uh, of arts and sciences uh, in our culture, and each one has its master. And I wanted, uh, for your birthday, to expose you to a true master in one of these fields, someone who would do something just once in a very unique way that would never occur again. So I'd like to... Um I'd like to show you an experiment based on uh, Japanese uh, cinema and a deck of cards. Uh, would you open up the case for me, Clay, sure. and, and uh, take out the advertising cards and the jokers and then start shuffling, uh, start shuffling the cards? I, uh, I'm a great fan of Japanese cinema. I know you've both spent time in Japan. This is really what, what, what I'm dealing with over here. Um, we don't need the, the jokers as well, but do give them a, a thorough shuffle or two. And then I'm going to also have you uh, give Leslie the cards and, and have her shuffle them uh, as well. And you really can shuffle them thoroughly. Matter of fact, I, I ask you to shuffle them thoroughly. Uh, this story is based on uh, a series of Japanese movies called Sword of Vengeance. And it stars Tamisaburo Wakayama, who plays Ito Agami, the decapitator to the Shogun. And uh, uh, very few people have seen Ito Agami. I, I actually have a, a picture of him in my wallet. Um, in your wallet? Well, actually, on my wallet. <laughs> uh, this is Ito Agami over, over here, which is kind of interesting. Now, you keep shuffling while I, I do this. Shuffling. Yeah, and uh, actually, it's a much better picture of Ito Agami. It's sort of a close-up yes. of, of Ito Agami. Actually, while I have this out, um, I have some of these uh, washi cards uh, as, as well, uh, which are kind of interesting. And I'm going to uh, take... Do you, do you happen to have a Sumi brush? Not on I, I do. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to use the, the Sumi brush and, and make a, a small prediction. I don't want you to see exactly uh, what I've done here, but you can, you can see some of it. So, so let me, let me uh, uh, do this. Uh, and I'm going to cover it up so you, so you can see that there is something. There is some prediction. Um, you know, I, I'm probably one of the only people who, who also has a picture of Mrs. Ito Agami. Um, I, I, I'll show you, actually. Um, I have her here as well. This is, this is uh, Mrs. Ito Agami, which uh, actually one should use to, to, fan, uh, to fan out this. Uh, I think I'll just leave, I'll leave this here. Uh, so you've shuffled the cards very thoroughly. As a matter of fact, you've been shuffling the cards for a moment, like, if I can have so them back. So, so here's the premise of this. This series of films, uh, which, is called, which is called Sword of Vengeance, is a rather remarkable series. And the thing I, I think that makes it so remarkable is this wonderful relationship of Ito Agami, who, as the official decapitator to the Shogun, is part of an incredible rival clan 
intrigue. And that rival clan are the Yagyus, the elder Yagyu, especially Retsudo Yagyu, who gets involved in this particular picture. And here's what happens. You've taken a deck of cards and you've shuffled them. I haven't changed the order of them. I haven't done anything else with them. What I'm going to actually do is spread them out, but I'm going to tell you we don't need all of them. So I want you to take a big bunch of cards and push them towards yourself. Literally push them towards yourself. Okay. Yeah, push them and push them out of the way. So we will not use them. Now, this, this, this film, Ito Agami comes home to his house and finds, this is a dreadful thing to talk about, that his wife has been murdered by ninja assassins. And this is true. There's just no way to, to deal with this other than to tell you this is the absolute truth of the situation. Uh, actually, Clayton, take a bunch of cards and push them towards you, a whole big bunch of cards, and, and we can put them, uh, that, that's actually fine, put them aside. So he's faced with this rather, remarkable, this rather remarkable decision. He sees in his house an infant child. And the child, because he has some remarkable composition, has convinced the ninja assassins he's not even in the house. They leave him there. An infant child, the wife is dead. Ito Agami, by the way, Ito Agami is played by Tomisaburo Wakiyama, whose brother in real life is Shintoro Katsu, the guy who plays Zatoichi. Right. You know, when I was at Francis Coppola's house, he has Shintoro Katsu's armor. It was almost exciting as finding out that you, in fact, choreographed Tomisa Borowakiyama. Take some of these away and push them aside. Because this, this is truly uh, an important he's thing. He's a piece of work, too. You know. He's a character. You know. uh, again, uh, Clayton, uh, like I said, we shouldn't use all of these cards, so take a bunch and push them, <laughs> and push them aside. Take a couple more if you want. Yeah. Okay, and push them aside. Now, Ito Agami is in, literally, in his own house at this particular point. He's in his own house. Um, take away a couple more cards. We need some, but take away, take away a couple of cards. That's fine. Ito Agami is in his own house. He has this child, Daiguro. And Daiguro has is, is got this amazing demeanor, but he still doesn't know what to do with Daiguro. He has to literally decide whether he is going to take Daiguro with him into this path of retribution, into purgatory, lone wolf unto the Hades with a baby cart, or have to kill his own child. How does he determine this? I mean, a horrible choice for anybody to make. How does he determine it? What he does is to give the child the choice of a ball, a beautiful spangly ball, or a sword. And the sword is in its scabbard, you know, but a little of it is exposed where they, uh, just before the hilt, a few inches. And the child is now crawling around trying to decide, you know, is he more interested in the ball or more interested in the sword? And Ito Agami decides if the child picks, picks the, the, the ball, it means he has a playful nature and he could never survive this particular journey. Hmm. If he picks the sword, it would show that he has the soul of a warrior. So ultimately, this is entirely about choice. You know, I think we can sense from the fact that there's six movies in the series, we have some idea might, what, what might have actually happened in this. Particularly number two, Baby Cart to the River Styx, where the Hidachi brothers, Ben, Ten, and Ray, create real havoc. But we're down to the choice. So here's denouement. This is what I want you to do, Leslie. We're down at the denouement. Think for a moment, and right now, put your left hand on one of those cards. Now. Put your right hand on a card. Now. Push them aside. The final choice will be yours. Push them aside. There are two cards left. I told you the final choice is yours, just like every other choice. Every other choice. Hand me one of those cards, take as long as you want, and hand me one of those cards now. Push this aside. One card in 52 which you have given me. Right. Now the choice of the ball and the sword is a big choice. It's yeah. the choice of life and death. But it's one in two. <laughs> this is really impressive. This is 52 different objects. 52, and for the first time, we're going to look at the card which you gave me, and it is the Two of Hearts. Uh, and you can see, I, I know you've both been to Japan, which is why I had you here. You can read what it says on this card. I can. You, you can't? Well, you know, the, the, the really wonderful thing about these Japanese movies is that they're, they're often subtitled. Yeah. Yeah, you see, uh, on the other side, it actually, it actually says the two of hearts, in case there's any problem. And just in case you think there's any problem this way or not. This is unbelievable. Uh, pretty great. <laughs> well, on my way to the luckiest night of my life. How did you do? I have no idea. It's amazing. It makes you wonder if things are as they appear to be. It makes you wonder everything, because I, I made the choices. Clay and I made the choices. You know, he didn't, he didn't uh, steer that in any direction other than telling us to take more away till there was one left. And it happened to be this, the two of hearts that he wrote before he started. The mastery of sleight of hand, um, as opposed to the kind of magic that we're used to seeing, say, in Las Vegas, or that kind of entertainment, this is literally inches away. There's, there's no artifice. It's... It's, it's more magical, more mysterious than any uh, staged illusion could possibly be. You're sitting there with a person, 
who um, simply with their hands, with their narrative ability, takes you into another world and, and helps you see uh, you know, things in a completely different way. It was a long process, our commissioning, Ricky, to come up with a book that would work for contemporary artists. And we do run a program here at the Whitney where we um, combine the work of contemporary authors and contemporary artists. And most of what Ricky was talking about was so historical that I couldn't find a way for contemporary artists to engage. Until one day, he was describing his extensive collection of blow books. And as he described them, I realized, and I think he realized simultaneously, that at last we had a form of book that would accommodate the work of contemporary artists, inspire them, and also allow a historical text by Ricky to describe this kind of book so that it would be both a subject and an object of mystery. So the result is a sort of a two-volume opus, I might say, a collaboration by uh, Ricky Jay, six contemporary artists. I'm very proud of it. I particularly like this uh, cover. You can see magic, magic, two-way. So you're, you start off disoriented, or hopeful. <laughs> the book has the wonderful quality to be able to change, you see. So if we look at alphabets, uh, this is some stemple foundry type uh -huh. and uh, old wooden type fries ornament. I mean, some really lovely old typefaces. Beautiful. That if one simply blows on the leaves, I know that sounds very strange. What you get instead are harlequins. Uh -huh. You see, there are no alphabets. You just get harlequins. And if you blow very carefully again, you see the origin of all books, the tabula rasa, the blank sheet from which inspiration <laughs> takes place, because that's really all it is, a book of blank pages. This is probably the greatest collection of, uh, of early uh, English language magic books in the world. Uh, there are a number of them which are unique. Uh, for instance, uh, this which is the earliest uh, of the books, uh, Thomas Hill's uh, brief treatise entitled uh, Natural and Artificial Conclusions from 1581. They have the first major, uh, major work on magic here, which is uh, Scott's Discovery of Witchcraft from 1584, which is really the seminal text in the, uh, in the English language dealing with conjuring. You know, never called magicians, by the way, called jugglers until uh, the 18th century, at least. Um, let's see. Oh, that's the... Uh, this again, where is... Here we go. This is, um, um, in many ways, the sexiest book in this collection. This is uh, Hocus Pocus Jr., the first edition uh, from 1634. I imagine many of the people who would watch this would wonder why this was sexy on any level, but uh, it, it's incredibly sought after. There, there are four known copies of this uh, first edition, which went through many, many editions, and it really is the first, um, the first illustrated uh, book devoted solely, solely to conjuring. Uh, this is an illustration for the cups and balls. This is a, a wonderful old effect called the cap and pants, and it appears for, in, in print for the first time in this book. And the patter of it actually involves a patron of a bar doing this and saying if he's successful, he would like the services of, uh, of a woman of negotiable affections for the evening. And uh, he, he is successful. So perhaps that's why it's the sexiest of these are. There really are uh, treasures and secrets to be found in, in these old volumes, and there's a practical current application that can come from them. Coming back to, say, a, a piece that you do, one of the many pieces you do, say, Cups and Balls, can you trace the history of that? Did you find the history of that here in this library? Well, yes, I, I mean, one, one can say that, uh, although, you know, there are written accounts of it that go with Seneca wrote about the Cups and Balls, for instance, uh, uh, being fooled by a setabulary by, by Roman conjurers using stones and cups. Um, and there are accounts which may precede that. But uh, in this library, yeah, we have the, the accounts in Scott's Discovery, the wonderful illustrations in Hocus Pocus Jr. So not only do I, do I use them in historical performance for technique, but even some of the patter literally coming, coming from these books uh, specifically and directly. Many people say that the cups and balls is the oldest magic effect in the world. They say that on the tombs of the king Beni Hassan of ancient Egypt, there are representations of Nile magicians doing the cups and balls. I'm not one of them. 
I do believe the cups and balls was the oldest sleight of hand effect in the world, that it was known to the Greeks and Romans. And one of the things that I find fascinating about it is it exists independently in two separate genres, the genre of the gambler as well as the magician. You may be familiar with this scene as the old shell game. In the British race course, it might have been known as thimble rigging. In the language of the streets, it was called the hinks, the dinks, the blocks, or the nuts. The idea was this, that one might put a ball or pretend to put a ball under one of the cups, but then the ball would appear where it was least likely. Watch again, if I place the ball in this cup and I move the others, you might think that the ball would be over here, but in fact, it's over here. Once again, if I place the ball in this cup and move them, you would think the ball over here. This is why people have been known to lose houses and even clothing playing this little game. Let me show you how a conjurer might do it instead. It would be a little different. The conjurer would take the ball and place it in his hand. He would use a magic wand and make the ball vanish. Actually, I should point out that conjurers also cheat. They're known to use many of these. So actually, the effect was played with three cups and three balls for a long time. I'm going to show you an actual sequence of events from a 17th century bestseller called Hocus Pocus Jr. The idea here that I will cover the center ball with a cup, place another one on top. I'm trying to make this ball literally penetrate through the solid copper cup, solid through solid, joining its mate below. Once more, now that you know the plot, two balls covered up, one ball now trying to penetrate two solid copper cups. Here's the idea. Remember, underneath two balls, on top one. This method a favorite of Matthew Buchinger, the little man of Nuremberg. Only 28 inches tall, the cups obscured almost his entire body. And all three below. Matthew Buchinger had no arms or legs, but he did have 14 children. The most famous man to ever play the game, the Italian Bartolomeo Bosco. Bosco appeared early in the 19th century. He cut an unusual figure. He wore a black satin waistcoat, black velvet trousers. He made sure his sleeves were carefully rolled up. He took a handkerchief from his pocket and carefully polished the tip of a magic wand, a wand which he said was made of a strange amalgam of materials known only to himself and Erasmus of Rotterdam. Above his table was a beautiful brass bell. He struck the bell and said the word, Spiriti mihi infernali obedite, infernal spirits obey my command. Ladies and gentlemen, Bosco's passes with the cups and balls. Vade. Jubio. Celeriter. Three gone, and yet three return. Uh, you'll hear people say, uh, as if it were criticism, that, that he is difficult or that he is an elitist, but the fact of the matter is most people are unwilling to hold themselves to the standard that he holds himself. He understands that magic is a performance art. It's not just something you box up and tell everyone you have. And what's amazing about him as a historian is his tireless effort to go to the source material. He's unwilling to rely on other people's accounts of what happened or what something said or what someone did. He, travels wherever he has to or pays whatever he needs to to find out for himself from the source material what really happened. So that's it's kind of remarkable. Now there's actually a great story about someone trying to challenge him once. He was at a karate competition, I think it was at Cornell, and uh, someone waited till he got in the shower. He's completely naked, absolutely wet, and someone hands him a one dollar bill and says do something with this. So standing there naked in the shower he takes a one dollar bill, folds it up, unfolds it, it's changed into a real one hundred dollar bill, and hands it back to him, and there he stands, absolutely naked and wet. Michael and Ricky solve problems. They come up with ideas that enable us as filmmakers to create the kind of scenes or, or, or create the kind of illusions that we want to without having to use visual effects. 
How are you? With Ricky and Michael, we can create a situation where it's actually happening, but it's by magic. So it's a little bit of film magic and real magic for me. We've got a story about a boy. And um, actually, it's, it starts with these, these, this group of dogs, golden retrievers. And have you ever seen um, these dogs that are in competitions where they catch frisbees? Yeah, you uh -huh. know where they ha they actually have these competitions where they throw the frisbee and leap. And oh, amazing, these amazing dogs. jumps, yeah. and the dog does all kinds of tricks, and then they score them and everything. Well, this is uh, a fantasy film where this dog, through a series of sort of magic potions and things and spells and things, turns into a boy. So the kid would have to catch the frisbee in his mouth. Okay, so this would be a recognizable actor, and it's got to be real time. Right, one and you know, of course, in, in the challenge of all challenges, like with the martini, I'd like to do it in, in one, one shot, one shot. Okay. without cutting away and cheating. All right. You know, so it would have to be um, something like that, mm. where... So right. neat. And also uh, where I wouldn't have uh, to, uh, you know, use uh, the computer yeah. to remove wires or whatever, things like that. Okay. So we'd like to do it for real. So that was a nice meeting. Yeah, he's just great. He's great. He's just yeah. great. He's great. And it's a nice problem, but I, I mean, we should... Uh, we'll play with it. We'll get frisbees and we'll play with it. Think you know what, let's go to the toy store. Let's do that now. Okay. I mean, you know, I really did. You remember that piece I used to do with the cards, where I would throw catch up three cards count. and catch one in each hand and one in my mouth. I mean, it, it's an unbelievably um, difficult thing to do. But this is a young today. actor, so clearly we'll be allowed to throw things at his face. Yeah, well, if it's Macaulay Culkin, it's, uh, his face is... This one we have a show. Here we are. Yeah, they have the soft ones. This one's kind of soft, but it's got wire in it. It's a little bit hard. That one would hurt like hell. So here's a straight one. This is just like a straight one. It's a bit of a purple. I think we have purple or purple. Yeah, purple. You know what? We should get a couple of those. You're a totally gross, boring nerd. You're a completely weird, greasy geek. <laughs> You're a real, gross, wacky weasel. Ah. So to recap, he has a boy with the dog inside, and the, the boy with the soul of a dog. <laughs> so that's exactly what I thought. Two and a half inches. <laughs> <laughs> My guess yeah. is correct. And the kids will probably be smaller. Let's hope so. And then what's the depth on There's two and a half inches? Nothing worse than a wide-mouthed you know? child. Right. That's an that's an inch and a half. So there's no way you're going to get something with Here, give me that. this kind of diameter to go an inch and a half into his mouth. Okay, so let's talk about the jump and get that out of the way. This actually was the first club that I ever played in Los Angeles. I used to do these seances here starting in the early 70s uh, on Halloween. I would do them every year. Um, I see in this one I'm wearing my Odd Fellow ceremonial robe. I, I would rarely go anywhere without it, uh, as, as if I needed a badge to prove I was an Odd Fellow. Um, they were great fun. We had a wonderful time here. I even very briefly toured as folk rock Rick doing Dylan parodies. That was one of my quickest incarnations. I think it lasted about two days, I, I, two dates. Um, what about a monologue, say, something like The Letter? What was that? The Letter. Uh, it was part of a piece where I had somebody take a bill, their own bill, a $100 bill, sign their name on it, and I put it in one of a group of envelopes, and I was going to burn the envelopes, and they had to choose an envelope. So they would pick an envelope, and I would say, 
It was actually the talk part of the Velvetones version of The Glory of Love. I hold in my hand the uh, three letters from the start of your fine, fine, super fine career. The first begins, my Ricky, my sweetheart, my wonderful one. I shall always be thankful for the things you have done. The second letter came from the start. It came from your pen, dear, but not from your heart. The third, the king, the joker of the deck. You ended your letter. Please sign my check. Why, well, you a foolish little fool for you to think you could take advantage of me in this way when my only sin has been loving you much too much. That's the story of, that's the glory of love. And they would, of course, drag me off the stage and beat me to a pulp. <laughs> of course, the envelope that was left was the one that did have the... The money on it. Oh, I, uh, one night I remember doing a piece here where uh, somebody in the audience was playing a guitar while I was talking and I threw a card and split the guitar in half. So this is actually the place where I would try out new material. And this club was literally my home club. Uh, I, I worked in those years for a wide, wide variety of musical acts. I mean, you might find me uh, opening for uh, the LA Four, which in those days might have been Shelley Mann and Lorendo Almeida and uh, Ray Brown. Uh, Herbie Hancock, I opened for at the Uptown in Chicago. Albert Collins, the Blues Act. Uh, country acts like Crystal Gale and Emmy. And I, I, I did it for years, and, and the days really run together. I mean, these were times where, you know, sometimes it was 28 shows in 30 days. You could barely remember the city. It was like talking to old circus guys, you know, who just knew where they set up the tent, and that's basically all they could remember. But I did spend the days, you know, haunting uh, antique shops and rare bookshops. That, that's really how I put most of my collection together. Uh, once I, I, um, I was throwing cards in those days, and I made the entire audience come out into the street because someone had dared me that I couldn't throw a card over the building. And I threw a card completely, uh, completely over the shot with the entire audience watching, and then they all came back into the club for the, for the finale of the show. You once held the world record, did you not, for card throwing? Uh, as far as I know, I still do. You the actual world record holder for throwing a playing card. Higher, harder, faster, and farther than anyone in history. Yeah. Great. I'm as comfortable with deception as I am with cameras or being on stage. Well, in a sense, you've made a career of being deceptive. Well, of thinking about it, of reading about it, of... Occasionally being deceptive, sure. But you, that's led you to a fascination with frauds and tricksters and cons. That's and, true. And gambling, is that right? Yes. Well, tell me about that. I think you'll have to ask me something more specific. A magician is somebody who often wants to gain an advantage, and sometimes that's pretentious. It sometimes comes from a great hurt in their background. I mean, this is not, I'm sorry. But, but anyway, that's what, I, that's what I sort of think. A great hurt so that you want to be five steps ahead of everyone else. Uh, magic is about control. Uh, and uh, little kids to say, what do you say when you want to show your superiority and your control? You say, I've got a secret and I'm not going to tell you. Uh, and magicians are, are big boys and girls saying, I've got a secret. Sure, that's a very uh, personal thing. Uh, and it is a control, and, and control is what the magician is doing. Uh, he's showing you as, in an audience that he can control uh, not just you, but control life and have some sense of mastery over things. The act of deceiving, deception, the con man, mm -hmm. what, is the, what is the con man saying to you? I find the, uh, I don't know whether it's as a, as a, as a writer or just as a, an actual bloke, but I, I, I don't know, I find the confidence game fascinating, the idea of that intelligent people such as you or me can be deprived of our hard-earned uh, money and self-respect by the correct, by a, a, a correctly structured drama, in effect. First man, come in, please. Hello, how are you? Thank you. Um, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to make this really simple. Okay. Do you have some money? Yeah, I'll explain the rules first, then you can put up as much money as you want. Is that a sealed deck? No, it's not a sealed deck, but you're absolutely welcome to look. How do I know there are readers on the other side? You don't know. You're going to have, you know, you don't. Okay. 
You absolutely have no way of knowing. It's a deck of cards. You don't know anything. Did you guys bring, who brought the deck? Anything about them. A guy that's a friend of mine. A friend of yours? Absolutely. A friend of mine. I'm going to make this so ridiculously easy for you that it doesn't matter if the cards are marked or not. We're going to play with ten cards. The choices will all be yours. It doesn't matter if the cards are sawed, slit, written on. Nothing matters. I'm going to make it absolutely simple for you. You're going to take five cards. I'm going to take five cards. Shuffle the cards. Okay. You don't have to know what the cards are. All you have to do is know the order of hands in poker. Would you play poker with a guy whose friend brought the deck? Would I? I play poker with anyone in the world. So we've got ten cards here. Huh? Okay, we've got ten cards here. Here's what we're going to do. You can put up as much money as you want right now. I'm going to cut the cards. You're going to deal. Okay, okay. Can, I, can I deal before you cut the card? No, you can't. We're playing like a poker game. I'm going to make up every rule. If you don't want to play at the end of this, you okay. don't have to play. So, okay. I, I, I Do you understand? Okay. I'm going to make the rules. If you want to play, you play. If you don't, you don't. Take out your money. Well, tell me what we're playing. We're going to play five cards. We're going to play showdown. There's no draw. So I'm going to get five cards, you're going to get five cards. Right, but I'm going to give you the choices and you'll understand. Okay. I'll put money in. Just explain me the game. I get five okay. cards, you get five cards. Then we look at the cards, and I put money down, and the best hand takes the money? Yes, the best hand takes the money. Okay. All right. And I shuffle, and, uh, and I deal. But you want to have the last cut. I'm, I'm going to... You've shuffled, I've cut... You want to shuffle again? Shuffle again. I'll cut again. I don't care. I just want to clear up one thing, and then we're ready to start. That before I deal, you're going to have the last cut. Yes, I'm going to have the last cut. Uh -huh. Okay. Do you not want to play? Get me a guy who no, wants to play. That. Get this guy out and get me a guy who wants to play. Now, I'd you're gone. Play. Peter, you're gone. I'd, I want to play. Then deal the cards. Let someone else take out some, money, let some money and deal the cards. I want to play cards. I don't want to talk. Can you take out some money? Either play or don't play. I couldn't care less. Okay, I've got some money. I got 20 bucks. This is all I got. Get somebody with money. Hey, how much money do you want? A hundred dollars is fine. Well, we haven't got a hundred dollars. Can then you take put 40 in fine. Yeah, 40 is fine. Okay, deal me a card. Why don't you shuffle an off-cut? Deal me a card. You don't want to play? Peter, don't play. Okay. What is your cut? Two Okay. Deal. Get the next guy in. Get the next guy in. What are you doing? It's fixing what? the deck. I mean, anybody can win money doing that. I you can, can do it. anything you want. Get the next guy in. I want to play some cards here. All right. You All just right. want to take my Go! Table, don't you? You get the Go! History! I'm not a great shuffler. It's fine. Relax, well, take your time. We're going to play a very simple game of poker. Okay. A game of poker in which you shuffle the cards and I cut the cards. But I'm going to give you every opportunity to win. Okay. Unfortunately, Peter didn't want to stay long enough for me to explain this to him. I will give you every opportunity to win. Okay. If we were normally dealing in a game, you would deal me the first card, you would deal yourself the second card. First, put up some money. How much are we playing for? Fifty. Fifty. Great. It's covered. Deal me the card, deal yourself a card. Okay, now you're going to shuffle them again. Shuffle the cards again. All righty. I'm not great with this. You can do that if that's more comfortable. It doesn't okay, matter to me. There we go. Now, deal me the... Actually, I should cut them at this point. I will. Okay. Finish the cut. Put this on top. Okay. Deal me the card. Deal yourself the next card. Shuffle them again. Okay. I'll cut... You cut the cards. You want me to cut Yes, you okay. cut the cards. Okay. Deal me the next card. Deal yourself the next card. Okay, you got it. Shuffle the cards again. Right. Deal me the next card, deal yourself the next card. Okay, and I don't cut that time. Okay. You didn't cut that time. No. Should I cut it? If you'd like, do you want to take the no, two cards no, back? No, that's fine. Fine, deal me a card, deal yourself a card. All right, is that fair enough? I mean, I'm not even touching the bloody cards. Turn over your hand, you have the best hand you win, I have the best hand I win. Okay, so that's just a straight up. Okay. Right, it's showdown. What do you have? Uh, two sevens, two queens. Two sevens and two queens. This is a good hand. You probably win. Except I have three nines. Thanks. Bring the next person in. <laughs> What's your name? William. Pleasure. Ricky. Oh. This is a game of poker with only ten cards in it. I've done this to make the game very simple. I realize you and I haven't met. I have no idea what you do, what your level of skill is. But I understand that, that it's not a group of people who play a lot of cards. You've shuffled the cards. If you place them on the table for me, I'm going to cut the cards. You can, you can, you can uh, return the cut, and I want you to now spread the cards out. Okay, just spread them out. And what's going to happen in this is, that's fine, that's absolutely fine, is I'm going to take a card and you're going to take a card. We're going to make a poker hand that way. Take a card, any card at all. I'm going to take uh, a card, you're going to take a card. Can I take two cards? Yes. 
Yes, I, I don't know. You bring people who constantly have to change the rules. Uh, I'll take a card. And how much are we playing for? I don't see any money on the table. A hundred dollars, fine. All right, I'm going to take a... Give me a card. I'll let you give me a card. Give me one of the next cards. I don't care. Take one for yourself. Give me another card. Take one for yourself. If I have the highest hand, I win your hundred dollars. If you have the highest hand, you win my hundred dollars. Turn over your cards. Pair of sevens, pair of queens. Turn over my cards. I won't even touch them. Turn them over. It looks like you win, doesn't it? Except you don't. Next person. Bring him in. Shuffle the card. Deal me a card. I'll tell you what. Since you are here as well, look at the next card and decide amongst you whether you want to keep that card or you want to give it to me. Give it to me? Yeah. Fine. Look at the next card. See if you want to keep it or you want to give it to me. Look at the next card. See if you want to keep it or give it to me. You might want to see what these cards are. You can go behind them and see. I don't care. You want it? Keep it. If you don't, give it to me. Okay. Take a look at the next card. You want to keep it? I have to wind up with five cards. You have to wind up with five cards. Look at the next one. You want to keep it? You want to give it to me? Okay. Look at the next one. You want to uh, keep it or you want to give it to me? Give it to him. Uh, it's going to get my pair of them. Yeah. We got one of those. But we got we, we to get both, both those cards. We've got three, so we have no choice. But we might as well see what they are. So you're saying give Why don't we, we just look one at a time? Why don't we just look at one at the time? No, 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 no. You look at them one at a time. <laughs> but you guys have both been here before. If you paid attention, if you were good poker players, you would know what every card is. That's the idea. Yeah, you have no choice. You just look at it and give it to him because you only got three okay. cards, right? And there are only two. There's there are sevens, nines, okay. Let him walk. Okay. Let, all right, look keep, at both of them. That. Look at both keep of them. That. Look at okay. both of them. Give me one, you take one. Okay. Okay. Uh, you definitely want to keep the seven because I'll give him three sevens. Okay. Yeah. And you got to give him nine. Great. Turn them over. You win. It's your money. I win. It's my money. Turn them over. Okay. What do you have? Queens. Pair of queens. Pair of queens. <laughs> I think it's safe to say. Turn over my cards. I'm not even going to touch them. Turn them over. There's a pair of sevens, a pair of nines. You lose. I'm out of here. Can you explain how you did it? He didn't need money that badly. That, that, that instead, I don't you know. know. Right, and he feels bad about cheating us out of uh, a couple hundred bucks. Well, I don't know. A lot of personality. <laughs> yeah. A magician has power. Power is uh, not totally controllable, even by the magician and our image of it and reaction to it. So the power, if somebody can do something with a pack of cards, maybe he can do something with me directly. If he can do something bad, maybe he can do something good. If he does something good, maybe he can do something bad. And so well, you never know. Where the power, uh, which way the power is going to go. So any magician worth his salt is a little bit on the uh, sideline, uh, not in the mainstream. And you, you bring them in when you want to be entertained or you want to be healed or helped, but you're not going to consort with them on a daily basis. He's a little bit too strange and too scary. But there's a room now and then for a magician who will take on the role, as it's always been and still can be, of saying, this is serious stuff, and watch out. Watch out. It may not go the way we expect, but something will happen. Huh? That's Ricky. As a rule, a man's a fool. When it's hot, he wants it cool. When it's cool, he wants it hot, always wanting what it's not. I, I once gave a lecture on nose amputations. Going back to the uh, early uh, 16th century, you find them in bridal paintings right and, and here as well. That goes something like, see gallants, wonder and behold this German of imperfect mold. No legs, no feet, no arms, no hands, yet all that art can do Third commands. The, First thing the joker does. of the deck, you ended your letter, please sign my check. Why, well, you're a foolish little fool for you to think you could take advantage of me in this way, when my only sin has been loving you much too much. That's the story of, that's the glory of love.